at the Asbury Park Music Foundation with Mike, Marissa, and Jarrett, Screaming Females. Uh, I just want to say thanks, first of all, to Asbury Park Music Foundation for having us. They do great work in the city, uh, bringing music education to some of the underserved youth in the city and throw concerts, and it's just a great organization at uh, asburypartmusiclives.org. So with our thank yous out of the way. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hello. How's it going? Hi. Um, you did a really good job. Thank you. Proud of you. Professional? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no one would know. I was surprised. So I'm very excited to have you because in about a month, it's the anniversary of the Cool Dad Music website, like seventh anniversary. Whoa. And you may or may not. Congratulations. Thank you. You may or may not know this, but you were the subject of the first post. (laughs) It was. Oh, we know. Oh, okay. (laughs) And so my first question is, how awesome does that that feel? (laughs) (laughs) It's really an honor, actually. Yeah. I mean, all joking aside, uh, anybody who can commit that much time and effort to, you know, supporting and uh, music and exposing new artists to people, I was just saying just earlier today that watching your your blog and Instagram and things just it's like wow cool dad's been seeing this band a lot like a couple times a month they must be worth checking out you know it's like it's a cool thing it's really it's really amazing it's, so the fact that we had anything to do with that is very nice maybe we went to your website this morning oh. and read we were like we should look up some you know like research Happy birthday to cool daughter number one. Yes, it was her birthday yesterday. 16. <laughs> 16. Well, you know. I grew up so fast. Thank you very much for the kind of words. But also, you know, at that show, that was the first time I had ever seen you. And I remember that was when Patrick was, like, really a lot more active on his Twitter. Yeah. And he had uh, talked you guys up quite a bit. And so I was, like, really excited to see you. I think you played first. And I was just like, what is happening? This is awesome. <laughs> And I think since then I've gone through like my Flickr account and stuff. I have to have seen you like 35 times or something <laughs> since then. So you've been a really important band to the site. What an honor. And uh, it's just great to have you. Is Do you that remember the night that Patrick broke a string? Yes. <laughs> yeah, he had the Les Paul Jr. That was he, amazing. He that broke so the string cool. and he didn't know, like he it had like those vintage tuners was... and he was putting the whole string in it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was yeah, one of my, like, I mean... Turned it the wrong way or yeah. something. One of my favorite parts of the performance was yeah. the 20-minute long. The 20-minute spoken word. But, but he did do, like, an interview with the audience during that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> that's, favorite, what, that's what Favorite mean. Seinfeld episodes oh, and all yeah. that stuff. Multitasking. Yeah. At first it seemed a little awkward, but then you're like, this I'm is entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I stood up on a chair for that whole thing. <laughs> well, that was the first time I'd seen you, so that was seven years ago, but you guys had already been at it for seven or eight seven years, years by then. Yeah. So I think you qualify as a veteran band now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you look back on, like when I look, say, back at that post or some of the earlier stuff that I wrote on the site, you know, no matter what anybody else thinks about it, sometimes I'm kind of like, oh, all right, well, I've changed. You know, do you guys, how do you guys feel about some of the stuff you started with or your earlier work? I often feel that way. But when we go back and relearn old songs or, we, you know, we always... <clears throat> have a have a pretty extensive catalog that we know that we can play on any given night. So we'll go back and we'll learn some old ones. And so often I'll be like, what was I thinking? <laughs> Why would I play it like that? I know. That? Now Mike's really into playing the right note oh. all of a sudden. He's like, yeah. oh, but this old song, in this old song I played the wrong note. I've been playing this note that's totally wrong for well, 10 I years. I the A last night. I know, it's great. <laughs> That was a great moment. Yeah. We discovered just yesterday that they, <laughs> these two had been playing a different note at a moment in the song for 13 years. You can wow. play different. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that goes into something else I was going to ask you about is that you guys rarely have the same set list. Or never. Never. Almost. Well, um, it probably happened once by accident. Statistically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there have been enough that it's happened yeah. statistically. But so you do... When you're prepping for tour or something like that, you decide, you know, we're going to dig back into the catalog. And yeah, we ha- we usually make a big, long list. The last tour was, like, I think 60 or 70 songs to pull from. Something like that. We want to encourage people to follow us around like deadheads. Yeah. So you come to a few 
few nights in a row, travel around with us, you're going to get a different show every night. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to be like Interpol and play the same exact set every yeah. night for the whole tour or something. Yeah. You can... We're going on sonic journeys and we want you to come along with us. Nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's really what it is, though. It's like, it's, there's, if every night we feel like there's a moment in the set where we're like, we don't know if this is going to work or how it's going to go down, that like, surely that like translates to the audience of being. You know, sometimes it'll it'll fall apart. That happens rarely, but it does happen. But the other moments, <laughs> the other moments, the other side of it is that it's like kind of a spontaneous, like euphoric moment, and I think that that does translate. And like you can tell if a band, we've been on tour with bands where they have not only the same set list but the same banter. You know, like they start a song and it seems like they have a moment where they're like. Sometimes it's written on the set list. Yeah, and and so you, I think that. I think that even if you aren't like, oh, that moment has happened every single night, there's something about the how it plays out that doesn't feel authentic. And there's, I think that the opposite side of that is what we do, which is that you're like, wow, they, I don't think they know what's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, we sure don't. We don't. <laughs> because we haven't played this song ever. Last night we played a song we've never played live. Uh -huh. So it's Wait. just as much for you then as it is for the audience to kind of yeah. keep things fresh. We did? Sick bed. Sick I think bed. we played it once. Okay. Maybe once. Maybe once we ever? <laughs> yeah. Before? <laughs> so that was another moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've, you're, you, the last two records you worked with Matt Bales, and I think I saw you somewhere, right? We've worked with a real producer. Yeah. <laughs> and so how does, how does that differ from the way you guys did the first five records? Um. Well, basically, we've never worked with a producer before because we, up until we had been a band for over 10 years, I don't think we really felt like we needed to have anybody interject their ideas. And, uh, not because we were frowning upon it, we just like were like, we can suss mm -hmm. all that stuff out amongst each other. But then, you know, we had made many albums and um, we were like, hey, it'd be interesting to work with a producer. It's something we haven't done yet. So um, we met Matt because I think he was in New York working on some other record, so he came over for lunch. Um, we had talked to him via email, and we were just like, you seem like a practical guy that we could bounce some ideas off of. But for the most part, especially on Rose Mountain, like, it was just like, if we hit a wall and we like were unsure of how to like wrap up a composition or something, we'd be like, Matt, just tell us what to do. Uh. As kind of like, like a last, re not that Matt's a last resort, but. Yeah. He was kind of like... It's like a tiebreaker. Yeah, like Even a though tie there's three of us, but we don't like operate on like some sort of like, oh, two people say yes, one person say says no. That's not mm -hmm. like we really try to come to consensus. So when there's like disagreements like that, and it's it's not that I really feel like this is my thought is the perfect thought. Because if we're all kind of sort of disagreeing about something, it's like nobody feels like sure. Mm -hmm. So if you go to an outside party yeah. and have that influence to be like, Matt, which one of these three ideas really seems like it's working and as soon as he says one of them you're like fine that's great right, cool yeah. <laughs> let's go with that <laughs> i think it's less we don't we don't really tend to disagree that often it's more just like we don't know what to do sometimes uh-huh it's good to have the a, songs. a leader so or, sometimes yeah. it's nice to be able to defer that question to somebody else and Matt yeah, sometimes his ideas answer. are terrible though yeah, yeah and we've, we've like, definitely no, oh yeah yeah, yeah. No, we've <laughs> told him no several yeah. times it's just it's not just, terrible <laughs> sorry matt <laughs> <laughs> inappropriate for the moment <laughs> But so even with that, you you as a band have remained pretty steadfastly DIY in terms of, you know, being your own management and booking your tours and all that stuff. Has that ever been difficult to kind of stick to that, or is that how you've always just wanted to operate? Sometimes it's difficult because we work with other people who might not uh, work on that same level, and so we're dealing with their managers or their agents or their, you know, whoever it may be, and they might operate on some different you know antiquated system for royalty payments and <clears throat> stuff like that and we and then all of a sudden we gotta like delve into the, their world play their game a little bit but other than that it's mostly you know we just kind of do whatever we want <laughs> yeah <laughs> and even even like with working with matt is like if you're a younger band you know and it's your first or second album and you're working with a label and you feel like they have a lot of um uh, sway over what you're doing because they've done all these records and they, they know more than we know or something that uh, they might install a producer 
and you're like, I guess we got to do what this guy says to do because mm-hmm. they gave us this producer to work with. The way we came to working with the producers is that it was a decision that that we made, you know, something that we wanted to bring in. So it's it's not that everything has to be the three of us do it, but it's more like we reach out, we work with people we want to work with, and we never feel that sort of um, that that their influence is more important than what we're feeling at any mm-hmm. given moment, you know? And then the rest of it, you just kind of fly by the seat of your pants and hope that they think that you're a professional and you know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Being professional is very important. Coming off as professional. <laughs> yeah, coming off as professional. That, Being that professional is much less. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you're about, to, so you, you're doing these two shows at the brewery, and then you're going up to Boston, like a week from today, to play with Bob Mole. Yeah, mm-hmm. Bob Mole asked us to do some shows this year, and it just didn't quite work in with a lot of our schedule. And we saw, we were like, "Hey, you guys are kicking off this tour in Boston. What if we just came up and played one show because we're such big fans and we're so honored to get asked to do shows?" And they're like, "Yeah, come play Boston." So great, go do it. And then you did um, the f- tour in the fall with the Breeders. You did a few dates, right? I remember uh, I was at the Terminal Five show, which I think was your first one with them because I think at the end Kim said something like how about screaming females that's the first time I ever saw them and then by the end of the run you're on stage with them playing mm-hmm. Halloween I just thought that was that was terrifying that song was is it? hard yeah it's in five yeah not I don't know what that means either <laughs> <laughs> I did see your account of I saw the YouTube video and I saw her remind everybody that it was in five uh, they were they just were like do you want to play the Halloween song and we were like yeah and we played it twice before we played it in front of people. They had full confidence in us, which was great. Yeah. And I was just like, are you sure? We didn't sound very good. Like us, not them. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. they had practiced it maybe more. Yeah, they did it here with know. whoever was yeah. playing with them here. I don't know. Well, it anyway. helps that when you mess it up, they just laugh. Yeah, we got better at it uh-huh. eventually. Yeah, it was good. They don't kick yeah. you off stage. It's, all, it's yeah. all good. There was no shepherd's hook. <laughs> <laughs> I wish there was. I yeah, was like, yeah. somebody <laughs> dragged me off the stage. <laughs> yeah. And so the, you've got the One More Night at the Brewery, which is a pretty non-traditional venue. Um, what What are your favorite types of venues to play? I mean, you've done... I mean, the brewery sounds good. That was a, that was a big factor when deciding to do the shows there. We went to... Uh, to uh, See Spouter and Daddy's there. And Shell Shag. Oh, right. And yeah. Shell Shag. And it sounded so good. We were like, all right, yeah, let's do it at the brewery. Mm-hmm. This place is cool. I like that a sellout there, too. They don't like overpack it. No, know? if you stand towards the back, you can yeah. totally survive. Yeah. Because yeah. some, some places that size, they'll sell, an, they'll sell another 30 tickets, and then mm-hmm. it's kind of a bummer. I thought the crowd at the brewery last night was really cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, our, our crowds are always cool. I mean, I think that people will come to our shows and it'll be, if it's some guy's first show, right? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm a dad. I'm 43 years old. I don't come to shows too much anymore. I'm going to stand out in this crowd. You're like, oh, actually, no, there's a bunch of people in your in your zone or here as well. And then there'll be an 18-year-old kid. It's like, or 16-year-old kid. It's their first show and they're having a great time. And I think that we have like a really broad appeal and that when people come to our shows they can feel really comfortable like almost or, uh, across the board no matter like who they are you know and that's always been exciting for me it's yeah. not something that you can like plan really but hopefully you can appeal to not just a single like demographic and that's exciting yeah it was great it was packed out and it was just so like cool and friendly yeah. and to quote mike the the <laughs> Mike gave a really good answer to this question about our favorite places to play one time, which is that anywhere that just gives a damn, which is like oh, a really yeah. good yeah. response. You know, it's just like you can go into almost any kind of venue, whether it be a house, a cafe, a bar, a dive bar, or like a really pro venue. If you walk in the door and it's a bunch of people who are like, hey, I checked out your band before you guys got here, like excited to have you here. You know, if you need something, just let me know. You could walk into a place and it could be somebody's house, it could be you know, a thousand, two thousand person venue and they're like, uh, we're going to get you guys out of here as soon as you're done playing and don't <laughs> talk to me at all and you get this this room that has no heat. I know it's January, but like that's just where you guys are going to be today. Yeah. And you're like, do you guys have water? And they're like, don't bother me. <laughs> you know, so it's like, it's the the deciding factor about a good venue is just that they care that you're there. Yeah, yeah I can see that, <laughs> especially since you've probably played thousands at this point. Yeah. Yeah, 
Um, and then I, I did want to touch on Marissa's visual art, because um, Marissa does all the artwork for your records and does her own uh, art and has been really getting into the doorstop industry. Dude, I knew you were going <laughs> to talk about doorstops. I was just talking about doorstops at our late lunch. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm just, I got this Mickey Mouse doorstop when in we were Pittsburgh. playing at the Roboto Project in Pittsburgh, and it's been my favorite object for the past, like, 10, ten years, years of my life or mm -hmm. something like that. I use it all the time because we have many dogs in my house, and I oh. like to make sure they can come and go as they please. So my Mickey Mouse doorstop, using it all the time, I'm thinking, what are there not enough of in the world? Like, or, like nice ornamental, unique doorstops? Yeah. Genius, million dollar idea. Yeah, do you do commission doorstops? I have a lot of requests right now. I'm okay. backed up of the wazoo. So that was a good, that requests. was, you, you read the, you took the temperature of the industry. Yeah. <laughs> I just want everyone you know the out there to know, my doorstops are hand chiseled, okay? I'm not, oh, the actual stop. You're not just stop. you're not just decorating a pre-made stop. Well, I stop. use a jigsaw to cut out uh -huh. the specific shape, whatever you want within reason, and then I hand chisel the door stop. Right? You don't see that often. No, you don't. <laughs> you won't get that kind of quality anywhere. So. Yeah. And then it's adorned with. Yeah, my door. art or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so door stops, Marissa Paternoster. If you have a door that just won't stay open. Okay, and finally, I had to grab a, I had to grab this because when I was doing my clearly very minimal research for this interview, uh, I saw an interview that you did last year, or yeah, beginning of last year with uh, Outright Magazine, and you very briefly got into dad bands, and you cited the Doobie Brothers and Poco <laughs> as dad bands. And so, it's a multi-part question: Do you stick by that? And do any of you want to add anything to that list? Steely Dan. Steely Dan. Steely Dan. <laughs> Steely Dan. My dad loves Little Steely feet. Dan. <laughs> Little feet. Yeah, that's a good one. I thought my dad loved Herman's Hermits for so. I, have I feel a... like you're reaching a couple no, generations back <laughs> into well, dad. the Hoople is, is a big time you. dad band. That's like cool dad. Band. That's a real cool yeah. dad. My dad is a cool dad too. He's uh -huh. a rocker. Um, but for some reason, I thought he liked Herman's Hermits. And then I bought him a bunch of Hermits. Her I can't even say it. A bunch. <laughs> like two. Okay. Like CDs for his birthday. And he was like, I hate Herman's Hermits. And it was mortifying. And now they just like languish in his CD rack, like covered in dust. But he likes he likes other he likes more contemporary stuff. The other day he was listening to Britney Spears' greatest hits. Hmm. Just very contemporary. Yeah, he's reading like yeah. a book about World War II. <laughs> well, she has new hits. While listening to Britney Spears. It was very strange. Yeah. But you all said Steely Dan kind of in unison. Has that something you talked about recently? Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, two days ago. Yeah, that yeah. box set. While Angela did my was youth. hanging out. That's my dad. Yeah. yeah. My dad loved Steely Dan, and I will also say my dad loved you guys. Oh, that's good news. Yeah. See? That was, I, I introduced cool him dads. to you, and he would spend hours like, going down YouTube wormholes with your videos, uh, and he'd call me on the phone and be like, you know, this, this band is actually really good. Yeah. So. I feel like that's the universal like dad uh, assessment of our band. It's actually pretty it's good. Actually yeah, it's pretty actually pretty good. good. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think I would like that. I mean, all, all dads are different. That's yeah. all I have to say. Yeah. But um, I appreciate, appreciate you guys taking the time to yeah, talk to me. Great. Thanks for having us. Uh, the show was really fun last night, I'm assuming it's going to be totally different, obviously. Are as you we coming discussed. tonight? I am. Do you want to meet my dad? Sure. Cool. That would be cool. Two cool dads. Yeah. yeah. I'll do that. And um, have a great time at the show again. Thank I you. I hope you guys Thanks. have fun. <laughs> Safe travels on tour in <laughs> Europe. <laughs> Put it in. Thank you very much, Screaming Females. Thank you. Aw, oh, shit. Ooh. <laughs> Enough bumps. And we out. <laughs>